I've been working as an imaging assistant for a couple, well, coming up to 18 months now. And um, part of my role uh, at the um, John Rylands Research Institute Library is to retrieve items. And I was asked to retrieve a particular um, collection. And these were the photo jewellery collections. And I was so shocked and wowed and just completely bowled over by what I was looking at. Here in front of me, these little gold and silver cases on this black foam background. And they just really spoke to me. Um, I mean, not, not actually, but um, they, just, they just said something to me and I wanted to actually find out more. Um, and I knew, you know, I was asked to um, write a proposal um, so that we could get this particular collection onto Manchester Digital Collections. So it was available for everybody, for researchers, for social sciences, for people, scholars. Um, but there's a wonderful, um, the wonderful aspect about Manchester Digital Collections is that you can really do a forensic analysis of what you're looking at. And I'll talk more about that later. But I just want to talk about the collection in general in that um, the jewellery, I looked at these pieces and I thought, well, yeah, they stay the same, you know, more or less. Um, there are, you know, things do age, but it remains the same. But the thing that changed and what I really I was interested in was the meaning and how these little jewelled pieces hold so many memories. So these stories and narratives. And in a way, it celebrates love, loss and honour. And we all connect to faces. We all connect to being human, if you like. Um, and I spoke to Tony about this. Tony and I have worked together on a, a, a few occasions regarding this particular collection. And um, so I just want to ask Tony, um, I know, as I said, you've handled and photographed these items from the collection. I just want to kind of just ask, um, were you surprised at how light, how heavy they were, um, how they actually felt? Because obviously you can't touch them when you've seen them online. What, what, what do you think? Yeah, thanks, Angie. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I think I think you've touched on a good point that you, the digital representation is totally different to actual the actual physical material in hand collection. And MDC does go a great way in investigating the collection much more closer than you could do if the item was in your hand. As we'll come come to that a bit later. Yeah. Um, but I think a bit of background really for the collection. Um, just to say that this first came to the John Moore Islands in 2017, and they came as a group, as a collection of items, as one, as one group. And there's nothing to suggest that any of these items are related to each other anyway. And um, so, so there's that idea that we construct our own ideas and um, our background about who these people are. Um, so, what the group is, if they're not related, but what they do show is they're an excellent example of photographic jewellery, but also excellent examples of photographic process. So we've got uh, the variety we've got in the collection, we've got daguerreotypes, ambrotypes, and even, even enameled photographs. Um, so it's, it's quite a good mix. And I think for this lunchtime talk, we've chosen three of our, I suppose, our favourites really to look at. And I think that's probably a good place to start is to look at one of the, the first items. Um, so do you want to start, introduce the first item, Angie? Yeah, um, so the first item um, um, is a family. Well, we assume it's a family because on close inspection of the item, you get layers. And what I mean by layers are the four portraits within this particular locket. Um, and Tony's got some, some ideas about that. Um, but when you look at these uh, particular portraits, you do, you do wonder who they were, and you actually place your own narrative on these particular images. You, you look at them, you scrutinize the faces, and we crop, we edit ourselves, um, and we, we, we look at the clothes and hairstyles, you know, it's just the way we do, we, we scrutinize, we look, um, and we bring our own personal stories to these particular items. Um, for me, this particular collection, uh, just the fact that there's four people and you just wonder if it was a family. Um, mother, this particular locket, um, the it's called Mother, the title's Mother, um, and I just love the fact that there's this huge crack across the, uh, this, the glass. And um, I'd like to kind of ask you all um, to think about your own mobile 
devices, if you carry a mobile phone, whether your glass, uh, you, the covers on your phone are, are broken and are you looking at your own images uh, through a broken screen as we are looking at this particular face through a broken glass. And I actually love the fact that this is how it is and how it remains to be. Um, and if you look at this particular uh, image, you'll see that she's actually wearing a brooch on um, around her neck. And because we've got Manchester D Digital Collections, you can go really close um, and see that these are uh, the, what, flowers. Um, it's quite a, a chunky locket, so it looks as if she's wearing it for a particular reason. Um, and I just think it adds to the, the object. And also, I think the broken um, glass adds to um, the fragility of this particular item. Um, and you can also, when you go in onto this particular object and all the objects, you can see the patina and the layers of um, the dust and just the history. And you just wonder who's actually be, been looking at these and um, the meanings and how the meanings have changed. Um, and Tony, I know you have an interesting theory about these items, don't you? Yeah, um, I think it's just because the locket is, is titled Mother. I think yeah. in, the, in the past, um, it's been discussed that this is a family of four, it's the parents and the children. But we've got, in this case, it's two daguerreotypes and two ambrotypes. So the younger couple are the daguerreotypes and the older couple are the ambrotypes. Now, looking at it in a photographic processes point of view, um, the daguerreotype is from 1839 onwards and the ambrotype from 1851 onwards. So at a stretch, you could say the images might have been made 30 years apart. So I, I was thinking maybe these are the same people. Is this a younger portrait? of the older lady yeah. and the same and the same with the with the young chap uh, and the the older man the father or we assume the father as a, as a family group um you know it's been suggested that they were might have been all done at the same time but i think it's unlikely you would have found a photographic studio that was shooting amber types and decara types at the same time um i think i think it was more likely that in my opinion, that these are shot at different times and then brought together into a locked door as a gift for the, for the mother, hence why it's titled Mother or Engraved Mother on the Locket. Um, so, you know, everyone brings their own interpretation, which is what, what I like about um, historic photography. Without the information, I think it's a little bit more interesting for you to make up your own opinions and make up your own stories. If I knew that this was... Mrs. So and so and her daughter, and I had those names. That's less intriguing to me. I don't, really, you know, I, I find it more intriguing that I don't know who they are, and I've I've constructed my own narrative almost about who these people are. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and again, so people will think different things. Um, and as you said about, you know, if you were handling handling these physically, one of the main differences between a daguerreotype and an ambrotype that you can't see on screen. The daguerreotype is like almost a mirror-like surface, so you can only view it from a very certain angle. Whereas an amber type is um, much more viewable and user-friendly yeah. as such. If it's in the hand, you can view it much more easily. So when, I, when, when we picked this item, um, I had to check with Anne, the curator, that these were in fact two daguerreotypes and two amber types, because I thought, looking at the young man, I thought this was an amber type. <laughs> and Anne was, in, you know, it's definitely a daguerreotype. I even had to go down to the stores and retrieve the item yeah, so I yeah. could have it in hand and look at it and go, yes, it's got a mirror like it's definitely a daguerreotype. So, so yes, in hand there are certain advantages, but again, you wouldn't be able to zoom in without a microscope or a, a strong magnifying glass like you can do on MP. And with this mirror door, they will bring them up on screen as multiple images. So, so you can, you know, you can um, observe them at the same time. Tony, Tony, do you mind? Yeah. Can I ask you something, please? Yeah, just please. In, just in terms of, um, because I know um, one observation I made is that not, nobody's smiling. Um, right. And yeah, and um, so would they have to have sat for a long time in order to get this, um, their pose and their, this image? Would, would yeah. it have been a long process for the sitter and the photographer? 
Yeah, if you imagine, it's not just turning up and sitting down and having your photograph taken. There's quite a lengthy process in making these images. Mm. Um, the daguerreotype, especially with the early posters of daguerreotypes, um, you're talking maybe up to 15, 20 minutes for some exposures, and that's a very long time to sit still. But as with most things, as it progresses and they fine tune the process, even things like optics and lenses, as they improve over the years, those exposure times come down. So by the time we get to amber types, you're into seconds, maybe minutes, um, depending on the studio, studio that's being used. So, you know, it's difficult to sit still, perfectly still, for that length of time. So I don't know how, how they do it. I myself, I do shoot some of these historic processes, and it is very difficult to make anybody sit still <laughs> for any length of time, let alone minutes. I, I have no idea. I do have a rough idea how they did it, but uh, I'm always yeah. surprised at the incredible detail. And, th and that's what I love is the fact that these processes, it wasn't like today, it's just so instant, so immediate, one swipe of a finger, you know, mm -hmm. but, but looking at these and, and what you're saying, you realise that people did make a real effort to mm -hmm. get their photographs taken. And that's why there was an effort in what they wore and an effort in how the hair looked, etc. But you can totally understand why they wouldn't smile because if you had to sit for any length of time, it just looked too fake. <laughs> Yeah, you know. there's there's various opinions on why people didn't smile. Um, okay. Whether it's that, whether it's that length of time um, that you're you're sitting posing, which is difficult to maintain a smile yeah. for that length of time because of the muscles it uses. Uh, another opinion is, you know, you, you're, this is a very serious event going for your portrait for a photograph. So you don't want to be sitting there grinning, um, like a buffoon almost. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a very serious event. Like I've like. Prior to photography, you'd have your portrait painted. Again, very very serious event. Yeah. Um, but as we, so, this is this is definitely a celebration of life and of family, and this takes us nicely into our second item, um, which has another angle to it. Do you want to have a quick mm. discussion about this one? Yeah, this particular. Um item I um, came across it in the collection and um, really intrigued because um, this child is very much alive uh, quite animated for um, for the from the other um, objects that we've been looking at the other portraits much more animated um, she's wearing what looks like quite a, a, a little party dress perhaps it's a birthday again we don't know and she's carrying a ball but it's when you look on the reverse and with MDC Manchester Digital Collections you can do this you can look at uh, both sides of the coin if you like and I was um, so intrigued by the symbolism um, that was loaded into the back of this particular um, item um, and this is very much my opinion but um, when you look at the, the, the reverse of this, you see um, a really detailed um, carved um, story, if you like, and you see an urn. Um, and so you, you, you kind of then think, well, actually this is a, a memorial piece. This is a child that's passed away perhaps. And this is um, the uh, image um, is very much alive and when you look on the reverse side you then realize that actually uh, this child has passed away um, so we see an urn um, holding um, what could be the child's ashes set on um, a square plinth and then you see a cherub and the cherub is looking up at the urn and um, very much a symbolism of love and um, uh, angelic order if you like and then at the foot of the plinth, you see this flame. Um, and in my opinion, this is perhaps a flame of light uh, to show the way to uh, place some light perhaps in a dark time. And then you see the tree and the tree has been um, the tree has been cut off, if you like. It's been cut off from um, from growth. And yet but the tree still the tree still bears um, leaves it still bears um life so um it's such an intriguing object and as i said this is just my opinion but this is this is what it's about and as tony said you know we don't know but we can come and look at this and if we look at the context because we have to put these items into the context they were made and at the time um you know a child born in the victorian era um you know the, the death was a, a common occurrence unfortunately and so i think these 
were actually a part of uh, the, the mourning process, if you like, and to keep some aspect of that child um, close to them. And um, I don't know what you think about this, Tony, because I know you've held, held it up close and personal. Yeah, I, I, like you say, everyone will take something different from each of these yeah. items. But for me, it was very much about, it. there's often discussions about post-modern photography and especially with Victorian images about people being described as being deceased, but they're not actually deceased. They're actually, you know, granted they're deceased now, but at the time of having a photograph taken, they're very much alive, as is in this case. So what I'm interested in is this reappropriation of the image. So it's very much a photograph of the child when she's alive, but it's been reused as a celebration and as a memorial um, of her life. So it makes you think, has this image been taken out of another piece of jewellery and put into this one? Has, um, is this the original mount and, the, and has the, the reverse silk and ivory work been added? You know, it, it's, it's that life cycle of the, of the item I'm interested in. And I think, um, as with all of them, you know, there were very personal items that were gifted to loved ones. Um, and at the time, they were very, you know, very, very well looked after. But then as time passes, um, people die, things get put into drawers or jewellery boxes. Then they are stuck in the loft or the garage. You know, and things get lost. We don't, we lose their meaning. We lose who they are. Um, but the actual value of the item to that person or family is sort of lost. Um, and they either get sold or broken up and sold for their precious materials or because um, some are gold, some are silver. Um, look, we haven't talked about um, the actual mount itself. You, know, it's, you, you would choose to purchase these when you went to the, to the studio and you would, I'm sure the photographer would try to sell you a gold one to get as much money out of you as possible mm. or silver or, or roll. It, most, most often these are roll gold or gold plate or something called pinchbeck, which is an alloy of um, tin and zinc, I think it is, like a, a, a gold alternative, a cheap man's version. Um, but this has been reused for this purpose. Um, and we're lucky now that these have come to the Rylands. They're no longer sitting in a box somewhere in the back of the door in, in the loft. They say these have come to the Rylands and now are being reappreciated uh, and being reviewed by uh, us and by, by everyone online. So it's, it's a, just an amazing life cycle of an object. I mean, you, you, so, sorry, Tony. Um, yeah. Could just ask you just quickly, you know, you know the. Um, so I've looked at several of the items now from the collection, but mm -hmm. what fascinates me is, um, and I don't know whether you agree with this or not, is the fact that these we've got very different um, cases, and some are inscribed, some are not inscribed. But um, would the cases, in your opinion, would you think that would be a symbol of uh, somebody's status, somebody's wealth, somebody's, you know, what yeah, do you think? Well yeah, well, of course, the material it's made out of, you know, the, the best you can afford is what you'd pay for. Um, and that would reflect on your status, as would the size of the plate, I suppose, because that would go up in cost as well. Um, there's also, when you look at the, each mount, not so much in this case, there's, in the metalwork, you might have little symbolisms of uh, memorial or love of, or um, little tokens, I suppose, in the actual mount itself. And those were all added extras that, you know, you'd have to pay for when you went to the studio. Um, Deeply personal then. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Deeply yeah. personal, uh, yeah. And something you perhaps, you'd sometimes, I guess you'd want to keep in your pocket or I guess in some, some instances, you'd want to wear it around a silk uh, ribbon or have it on, yeah. a, on a fancy chain, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, so we've put no, first, the first item we looked at was a, a locket. This is a pendant. There were yeah. also, there were also like uh, for a man, it might be a, a pendant for a watch chain for your pocket watch. There were all sorts of different items that you could have your photograph attached yeah. to. Yeah. Um, well, the, fam the, family, the family photograph, though, would that be quite a feat of engineering in terms of how yeah. that was put together? Yeah, yeah. It's, quite, it's quite a clever little item, isn't it, when you think realise that's four little yeah. pictures in there. And they are quite small, you know, granted we can zoom right in on the screen, but we're talking, you know, 20, 25 millimetres for that little pocket. Yeah. You know, so we're talking like the size of it, like a thumbnail for some people, I suppose. 
they, they, are, they are tiny little precious little things. Yeah. And the other thing about another thing about the case that it's in the man is that it protects the item, the photograph. You know, if 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 you took that daguerreotype out of its little jewelry mount, it's very delicate. Now, a daguerreotype is sometimes sometimes has been described as being as um, as delicate as a butterfly's wings. Oh. Now, it's that powdery and soft. You could you could wipe your finger across it and scratch it all off quite easily, compared to the compared to the amber type, which is a bit more resilient because it's varnished. So the daguerreotype. So we're quite lucky that these are still in main mount. And I love that. Dis I love that description. <laughs> <laughs> the butterfly's wings. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's it, it's a perfect description for a daguerreotype, I think. Yeah. So uh, I think shall we move on to the third item that we wanted mm -hmm. to look at? Yeah. Okay. There we go. So it's this one. Oh, I love <laughs> it. I absolutely, honestly, I can't tell you how much I love this item. It really excites me. <laughs> um, I just love it. And I know I'm going to, I'm not going to say too much about this one because I know Tony's got um, a theory about this one and it's so interesting and, um, and it's nice that um, we're both having our own opinions and we've both got our own ideas and see things. And that's what it is. You know, you see, you see the world, we all see the world in different ways. Uh, and we've certainly looked at these um, items in different ways and um, come together. And it's been so interesting and fascinating exercise. But what I really love about these is, and it's because again, because of Manchester Digital, digital Collections and how we can, um, as I said before, we almost do a forensic, uh, scan across these uh, images. Um, what I really love are these little gold additions to the photograph. Um, these uh, painted on the painted on jewellery. So you've got the red necklace there that looks quite crudely painted, but nevertheless it gives an indication of the jewel. So this was obviously done for a reason, and the sitter obviously wanted the photographer to uh, employ somebody to go back into this particular piece and paint whatever they wanted to paint. Uh, Tony, you've got your own theories about this, haven't you? Oh, well, that's not so much a theory. It's just um, that idea again of passage of time, and uh, you know, a photograph is very, let's say, instantaneous. But this does show again passage of time within a family. So I, I think it's quite obvious that you could say that these, this is the same uh, two people in each image. Of, I'm assuming mother and daughter, and passage of time. So maybe what ten years? Do you think between when the images were taken? They're both daguerreotypes, um, but there's obviously a passage of time between the images being taken. And again, we don't know why they were taken. Is it a celebration? Is it an anniversary? Uh, we, do, we, don't, we don't really know. Maybe somebody would know from jewelry, the clothing or something like that. But as you said, with, the, with those little embellishments of gold and the red for the, for the chain here, which might be coral maybe, uh, it is not slapdash, but a bit uh, heavy handed. It isn't that precise. But when you think about how small that is, how many, how many millimeters in size someone is applying this, um, it's not surprising. But what is surprising is when we zoomed in on this one on the left, you can make out these strands of hair. Well, I'm assuming it's hair. Um, now, hair work in jewelry, especially Victorian jewelry, is quite common. Um, and it's usually woven or thre threaded in some way in quite intricate patterns. So it's, it was surprising to see it on the front of the image here, uh, which makes you think, is this an accident? Has it been purposely put there? Um, we don't know, but it's quite, it's quite a nice little touch that you wouldn't have seen with your naked eye. I hadn't noticed when I was photographing until I actually zoomed right in and had a look. No, no I, I agree. Really, when I when you pointed when I well I went on to MDC and I had a look myself, I was quite wow, you know. Yeah. Um, and it's almost like that. The, there's um, and again, it just adds more mystery and intrigue to the object. And you kind of you kind of come away wanting to know more and, and you know keen to do more research and to look at the um, the history of the um, of this particular genre of photography. But yeah. yeah. And hair work was hair was often used um, in jewellery, um, placed next to a, a, an image or perhaps in an in locket alone. Yeah, and, uh, I, I think we do have examples of um, that in the collections. Um, I'm just going to quickly whiz through and have a look. Who was it had had some hair in a locket? I remember rightly. It's this it's, uh, that dapper chap there, that isn't it? Same. Yeah. 
There we go. If I go to the Mirandola Village. That's the, yeah. And if you can see here, you can, with Mirador, it's, it's really clever. You can add additional slots, um, and not just from your own collections, but from other collections, from other institutes as well. So you can bring them all up on the screen. I love um, that. So this obviously is not an intricate um, woven hair work. It's his locks, we're assuming, it might, be, it might have been from a loved one. But looking at his lovely head of hair, I would assume it's the, these golden locks are his, and they have just been placed, curled into the lock. And what, I, what, I, what I love about this particular locket is, though, is that the photograph, I mean, you could kind of put an age to this photograph, but to the hair, you can't really, you know, it looks freshly cut to me. You could, it, could yeah. have been, it could have been cut yesterday and placed yeah. within the locket. So, yeah. uh, and that's the reason for the hair. It's such a, a significance. Um, it doesn't degrade. And I guess it's uh, the closest you're going to get to somebody and, you know, fr from, from the person, from the living yeah. person. So, yeah. or the dead we'll, person. You know. we'll, we'll, not, we'll not even mention DNA testing. No, <laughs> don't go there. <laughs> no, okay. Yeah, I, I think this is an ideal opportunity to hand back to Sally for some questions and answers. What do you think? Yeah, brilliant. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Tony and Angie. That was so interesting. And you showed us some really moving items from the collection. Um, so it's just so great that anyone can access these collections digitally through the Manchester Digital Collection website and explore them in so much detail. Um, now, I know that there's an array of incredible collections available for people to look at uh, through the MDC website. So I hope um, after this session, um, our viewers will go on the MDC website and have a really good uh, explore through all the beautiful collections we have digitized. So, um, Rakaya, have we had any questions for Tony and Angie? I, yeah, absolutely. We've had loads of questions in. Everyone is absolutely loving these items and loving the kind of um, observations that you've had about them as well and the talks. Um, so the first question we have is um, from Anne Therese. Sorry if I've got your, pronouncing your name wrong. Um, and he, they asked, um, you mentioned the items came to collection in 2017. Is there any info on the donor or the provenance of the item? And are they all from Britain? Good question. The one yeah. for the one for the curator, I would imagine. Um, they all they all came from the one. Uh, I'm not sure if it was an auction house or from a commercial seller. Um, so they were all purchased together, but there was, I don't think there was any other information available. And looking at the images, I'm thinking they are British. Fantastic. Um, we've also got a lot of questions about the rosiness of the cheeks in the portrait mm -hmm. um, and if they were hand painted or not. Yes, yes. Um, uh, the, the, the blush or the rouge to the cheeks and sometimes the lips um, is hand applied um, on the daguerreotype and the amber type um, with some more finer hand painted photographs in the earlier days that was down to as I said as I mentioned um, paintings or miniatures before photography they were hand painted your likeness was painted and some of those artists were employed by photographers to apply color to photographs um, and again it's depending how much you pay at the photographers to how skilled that retoucher and uh, painter is so I guess you get what you pay for. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, there's another question about um, the tradition of mortality portraits, particularly of children in the period. Um, so it, the question is, do you have any in your collection? And can you comment on this cultural practice? Angie, do you want to say something about the cultural practice of that? or? I, th I think this is something that's, you know, it does, there's a, there's a real kind of area of research here. And if you just, you know, I, I've done a little bit of research prior to doing this particular, uh, having this discussion. And it's just, it's so, so, uh, there's so much. Um, but particularly in terms of the Victorians, I think that was something, um, I know when um, Prince Albert died, Queen Victoria, uh, cut a little bit of, um, of Prince Albert's hair and kept that with her. Uh, and mourning was a very, very, um, it was something that was, um, 
how can I put it? It was a very, very obviously serious, but it was um, almost to the point that, you know, it was something that they um, they did. And the person who had passed um, was, uh, I think it's for me, I, I don't, sorry, I'm not answering it very well, am I? But there's, there's, a, there's a wealth of research out there. And this particular image for me really did resonate um, on many, many levels, to be honest. Um, but I, as I say, you know, I'd, I'd need to do a lot more research, but I do know that it's, um, it was, from what I was looking at, it's very much steeped in the Victorian era. I wanted to keep and, um, and celebrate, I suppose, the life of someone that you'd lost. And as I said at the beginning of this talk, this particular collections, um, it's about being human and it's about loss, love, life, death. Um, it, it's all tied in, all tied in together. But yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating aspect, in my opinion, to this collection and a fascinating aspect um, for research. Thank you and so I, much. So I'm just saying, as to items in the collection, I don't believe there are actually any, as far as I know, any examples of actual post mortem no. portraiture. Um, I think a lot of people get confused when they look at historic images. Um, quite common is the head brace when it's in shot. Um, a stand with a, a bar that comes out that holds your head in place. It's basically there to stop you moving around during exposure, during the long exposures. Mm. Some people interpret that to a, a contraption that holds a dead person up, uh, holds them in place, which is not correct. So you do see a lot of images described as being of someone who's deceased and actually they're not. Um, so it's quite easily to miss identify something, I suppose. And another one is with eyes. If yeah. eyes eyes move or somebody has blue eyes, um, especially with wet plate, the collodion photography, they're quite pale and um, the, the way it reacts to light. So some people think, oh, they, 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 they've died because look at the eyes, they're a bit weird sort of thing. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't believe we have any in the collections here. Thank you so much, um, Tony. Um, we've just had a, a message from Anne Anderton, who's one of our curators as well. And she said that we, we're not aware of any images taken post-mortem in our collection. No. Um, it's much more common that we have memorial pieces. So pieces that have yep. been put together after. So thank you so much for that from everyone. Um, the other question we have is about kind of identifying the time of these, uh, when these pieces were taken via dress. Is that something that we do or something that is looked at? That's beyond my area of expertise entirely. Um, costume and dress, I know very little about, but there are people who specialize in that, um, in, even in just the hairstyles, jewelry, and costume, uh, costume, but what they are wearing in their dress, yeah. So you can date a photograph from that, but saying yeah. that, you're assuming that person is up on current fashions and trends. So <laughs> if it was me, I'd be looking as if I was 30 years old. Yeah, <laughs> that's so true, isn't it? It's just an assumption. So it's all a bit guesswork in some cases, isn't it? Yeah. Um, we had a few comments that people agreeing with you, Tony, that the um, that it's the same couple photographed at different times okay. of their life on one of the lockets. Um, and we had some interesting ones about um, perhaps they're not smiling because their teeth are bad. So people oh, are yes. kind of like well. not showing their teeth to, just to show the best image of themselves. Yeah, maybe. Um, Who knows? Yeah. Okay. As well. Um, another question we've got is, is there a particular European city or jewellery maker that specialises in the manufacture of photography jewellery? Um, um, that's a big uh, question, isn't it? Yeah, um, I, I can't answer that one, but I can, I can say we've seen examples online of photographic catalogues with each of the mounts. So you could, you know, you could name the design you wanted, the size you wanted, the metal you wanted. So there are exam digitized examples of catalogs online. And I know we saw a few of those when we were researching for this, this talk at this lunchtime. Yeah. So, you know, th th there are examples out there, but it's, again, it's not an area, um, photographic historic jewellery mounts, uh, I'm afraid. Fantastic. Um, we've just got another comment as well. Someone suggesting um, that there is a Jeffrey Batchen's work is a good introduction about memorial portraiture and jewellery for okay. anybody who wants to kind of have a look at that more after this as well. 
Um, we've also got another question. Um, I think it's probably exactly the same and around the same answers that you've already given is how does photography jewelry fit within the wider Victoria tradition of memorializing and objectifying individuals through their portraiture and through lockets holding their hair? But I think Angie might have touched on that in saying there's a lot of research around it and it's something that's yeah. very intrinsic to the yeah. culture. Definitely, and very it's a it's a very personal individual choice, and you know, uh, and I think uh, can, can I just say as well? Um, I want to just before um, I forget, I just want to thank Anne Anderton because Anne Anderton uh, has been amazing and uh, really inspired me regarding this collection. To be honest, um, so I just wanted to thank Anne, which is watching, and thank you so much because you've been such an inspiration. <laughs> it's it's been fascinating, and I've got so much more to learn, Anne. So I'll be coming knocking on your door and finding out a lot more. Please. <laughs> Absolutely, and I think everyone is going to be doing that as soon as we like get off <laughs> this call and get off this webinar. I think people will just be rushing um, to have a look and to read more about it and to look into those traditions as well. And yeah. um, this is one I do think we can answer is um, how does the John Ryland Library um, conserve and look after such objects? when they contain such a mix of materials. Um, would Tony, could you give us a little insight? Yeah, I, I, I think, yeah, I think as with most, most institutions, the allocation of time and resources is quite difficult for how you would approach each of these very delicate items anyway. Um, as they are all cased, there's no actual, uh, I don't think it's recommended that you would take them apart in any way to clean the inside. I don't think that would be a good idea. Um, these are, these have been digitized without any collection care treatment. So they are covered with little bits of dust, um, little traces of fabric and things like that. So these are pre any treatment. And again, that comes down to how much time there would be available. But these have, all the photographic items have been rehoused into um, conservation friendly material housing or envelopes or whatever you whatever the item might be. And everything that is photographic or contain, contains a metal is handled with gloves. Um, so no bare fingertips are on any of our photographic or metallic materials. Does that help? Brilliant, thank you. And um, I presume that would, um, we had a separate question about, I'm gonna tell, say this totally wrong. Is it the Gadera type? Oh my goodness. Gadera type. type. Thank you, Tony. It's all right. <laughs> well, I have tongue twist there. Um, about the treatment applied on those, but I presume it would be exactly the same as all these lockets. Um, yeah, as they, as they are still cased, there's been no treatment to them at all. And I don't think there would be um, uh, at any time soon. Can, can I just, uh, though, add, Tony? If, um, yeah. I, I just actually think that it's really nice to be able to see uh, the patina and the layers, you know, because um, I just think it adds to the history of the object. And certainly with the, uh, the image of the, por the portrait with the hair that we were discussing earlier, we weren't too sure whether that hair was uh, from a brush or from, you know, all these oh, things. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they all, to me, they add such a, they add so many layers to, to, the, to the object. And as I said, with MDC, you can get really up close and personal and scrutinize these, these, um, these lockets. So, you know, I actually like, I find the idea of them not being over kind of cleaned. We, we look after them, you know, but, um, but yeah. in terms of um, how they are. Yeah, I think it's, it's someone from Collection Care would have to comment on how these would be treated. Correct, um, yeah. But they are, as, as you see them here, is, is as they were um, supplied to the University of the Timber Library. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Um, it's great to have an insight into the fact that, um, into the kind of conservation, how we keep items. Um, and the other question we've got as well is, what camera did we use um, to it. photograph these ob objects? Which I'm sure Tony knows yeah. exactly the answer to. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we use a phase one system, um, which is top of the range, medium format digital uh, photography. Uh, again, a macro lens. But the thing is with, these are very, really small. So there are various ways of photo. These were straight macro shots, uh, but there are other ways of photographing such small items to get as much detail as possible. Uh, something called focus stacking. But in this case with a daguerreotype being a mirror-like surface, it's really difficult not to get reflections in certain areas. 
Um, with larger daguerreotypes, you have to angle it a certain way. But with these small items, um, we are close enough that the actual lens itself crops out mostly in any uh, extraneous light that might cause any problems in the, uh, in the area of the plate itself. So these were fairly straightforward to digitize. Larger daguerreotypes are quite difficult. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, and the last question that we have is um, about morning rings. And I don't know if you can answer this mm -hmm. one, but would it be too small to contain photography? Um, no, no um, it wouldn't be. Um, you can have micro photographs. That was uh, even in Victorian period, there were very, very small photographs. Um, so I think it well, depends on the size of the ring, I suppose. But yes, you could have uh, jewel, photographic jewellery rings, yes. Oh, brilliant. Thank you so much. And, and that's all the questions we have. So thank you so much, Ochoni and Auntie Fran. So no. Um, Okay. Thanks very much. I'll just stop sharing the screen. So yeah. there we are, back in the room. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Angie and Tony, for that fascinating session. And thank you to our viewers for joining us today. We really hope you enjoyed this session and you come to more events in the future. Um, please do explore the amazing collections digitised on the Manchester Digital Collections using the link www.digitalcollections.manchester.ac.uk. If you'd like to know more about uh, future events, then please follow us on Twitter, Instagram, our website. Um, we will be emailing you with an evaluation form and be really grateful if you could fill that in for us. Um, and from everyone in the team, we hope you have a great weekend. Thank you so much and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.